Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, today's store lecture is Dr. Larry Gold, who is currently founder and chairman of the board and CEO of Somalogic in Boulder, Colorado, a company of about 100 people who have succeeded under Larry's leadership to be the world's leading innovator in proteomics technology, and that's my opinion. Larry is that rare individual who has, over the course of his career, combined great science with street smart entrepreneurial skills honed over 30 years in the biotech industry. Larry's successes in the biotech industry are legendary, as is his generosity as a philanthropist. And he's just a kind of a, a decent human being, even though he's an entrepreneur. He is a decent human being. It has been a privilege to be a friend of Larry's uh, rather late in both our careers, which was supernaturally ordained by our common beloved friend, the late Carl Woese at the University of Illinois. I have to say that everything told me, uh, that Carl told me about Larry before we'd met turned out to be true, and it's going to take a few beers tonight uh, for me to tell you exactly what Carl told me. Uh, one story that Larry told me himself, actually, uh, was that he interviewed here for the chairmanship of the microbiology department 30 years ago, 1987. People are kind of wondering, looking up in the air, yeah, maybe, maybe that happened. And Larry said, well, he would, they wanted to give him the job, and he went to see the provost, and, and uh, they said, well, what does it take to, to have you come? And, and Larry said, well, I want veto power over all hiring decisions in the department. All departments, all departments. Well, I guess the rest is history. <laughs> That's a good one. I hadn't heard that one before, but I think we all ought to remember that one as we think of uh, interviewing. Uh, people interviewing for positions, but um, that gives you an idea of the kind of person and the kind of uh, confidence that Larry has in himself. Uh, so although Larry needs no introduction to many of you, I'm obliged to provide uh, some formalities uh, on our guest today. Larry received his bachelor's degree from Yale uh, a long time ago. I won't even give you the date. And his doctoral degree uh, from uh, University of Connecticut at Storrs. He did a postdoc at the Rockefeller University in the lab of Fritz Lippmann, a famous biochemist who won the Nobel Prize in 1953 for his co-discovery of coenzyme A, along with Hans Krebs. He did a second postdoc at the University of Geneva with Dick Epstein, where I believe you learned the genetics of the T4 phage, bacteriophage system. Larry then joined the faculty of the University of Colorado, Department of Molecular and Cellular, Molecular, Cellular and Developmental Biology in 1969, the year of Woodstock, and the landing of the man on the moon, first man on the moon. In 1981, Larry founded his first biotech company, Synergen, which sold to Amgen in 1994 for $239 million. Larry formed Nexstar after that in 1992, which was acquired for, by Gilead Sciences in 1999, a transaction that I believe was valued at $550 million. So you'd think Larry would just kind of ride off into the sunset after that and go fishing in Colorado, but that was not enough. Larry decided to do it again, and in 1999 he formed Somalogic, where he currently serves as founder, chairman, and CEO. I will venture to guess that uh, Somalogic will be Larry's biggest success. Yet. And he is having fun, lots of fun doing what he's doing, mostly because he disdains venture capitalists. He likes to do things his own way and with his own money, and you have to respect that. Wow. First and foremost, Larry is a great scientist. <laughs> he is well known for his work on the regulation of translation by messenger RNA using bacteriophage T4 as a model system. And he's going to tell you, I'm sure, about his work on creating and screening libraries of oligonucleotide sequences using the process, uh, a patented process that Larry developed called Celex, in which he, he identifies high affinity oligonucleotides, uh, with, uh, oligonucleotides with very small nucleotide sequences with high affinity against proteins, which is the basis of the method that he's going to discuss. This technology, as you'll see, has wide application in disease diagnostics, particularly in immunology and oncology, and as well as in determining the wellness state. 
Larry was elected to the National Academy of uh, Arts and Sciences in 1993 and the National Academy of Sciences of the United States in 1995. He's the holder, ready for this folks, of more than 170 patents. Larry has received several major awards, including the Chiron Corporation Biotechnology Research Award and the European Inventor uh, of the Year Award in 2005. Larry, I just wish you'd make a mention of yourself and achieve something in your life. <laughs> so uh, first, I really need to thank the Storer uh, family for endowing this, uh, this wonderful lectureship that we have here, our premier lectureship in the life sciences. And it's my great pleasure to turn over Podium to Larry Gold, today's Star Lecture. That's so nice. Huh. I've, in my entire life, I've only been introduced once, even close to that. And, and I remember it was Lucia Rothman Denise who actually, when she got to the point where Harris sat down, she actually then told the audience everything I'd ever published. And I sat there experiencing the sin of pride, wondering if she would forget something, whatever. And I got up, by the time I got up, it was 15 or 20 minutes into the seminar, people were looking to the door and didn't know what was gonna happen. And I actually said in Chicago, I said, you know, if I'd have been two inches taller, I would have done none of it. That was what I said, because I didn't know what to say. Um, so thank you, Harris. It was, it was wonderful. So um, I have a plan. Um, the plan is to make a little introduction and then to show you the plan and then to show you some biochemistry and then some stuff. And, I, and please interrupt any time you want to, OK? Oh, I don't need this, do I? Is, is that, do you, can you still hear me in the back? Is that OK? Ah, so I have to use this. Uh, okay, um, okay. So um, this is a slide of all the omixes that are going on, and you know all this. And um, and the work we're doing is entirely about the thing in red, which is the proteomics. So I'm going to tell you about proteomics. Everything I'm going to tell you could be said about any of the other omixes, except probably genomics. Genomics is about risk. Proteomics is about status. So this is a slide that will make you remember that for the rest of your life, because those two guys in the red circle are the same guy 50 or 60 years later, 50, I guess, 55 years later. And those two guys have the same DNA, more or less. and. Uh, and uh, so if you knew their genomes, you couldn't say much about their health status, okay? And that, that's what I think. So the other omixes, this whole list, is capable of doing something that's actionable, and most genomics is not, okay? Not all, I'm not an idiot, but not all, okay, not most. So this is what I'm gonna do. Um, I'm gonna tell you about a new class of reagents, just reagents. This is a biochemistry kind of lecture for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. These are the new version of aptamers that we make, which are different than, I love this phrase, different than classic aptamers. So if you call your own science classic, you're a little bit of an idiot, right? I'm sorry. But it's, you know, there's been a lot of papers and there are thousands of papers and, you know, a thousand or two thousand patents about, mostly about the thrombin aptamer. So we have a different kind of molecule. I'm gonna show you how different it is and how much more useful it might be. And then I'm gonna tell you in the big red thing, a big proteomics thing, and then I'll show you a bunch of data, 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 um, and then I'll tell you where I think this is going and then we'll quit. So you can interrupt anytime you want. So <clears throat> the idea, which started in 1989, was that you could take a single-stranded nucleic acid and you could hope it would fold up into some three-dimensional globular shape and it would be like the antigen combining site of an antibody. That was the idea. And uh, Jack Shostak and Andy Ellington did that. 
around the same time as Craig Turk and I did that. And, um, and we've been, I've been working on the same thing since 1989, like a certain failure of imagination, you might say. And the idea is, this is the, the exact slide that was in the first paper by Craig and me, and it was also in the first paper by uh, Andy and Jack. And the red thing is what's changed. The red three things on this slide is what's changed in the last 15 years that you've not been paying attention. So you start off with a lot of molecules in a tube. It says they're 10 to the 15th. Sometimes it's 10 to the 14th. It doesn't matter. It's a lot of molecules. And the molecules are made chemically. They're single-stranded RNA or DNA. And they have a region of random sequence. This is kind of great. This is, I used to, maybe I should have come here. <laughs> Except that, that I, none of you would have gotten jobs because I would have vetoed all of them in my spare time. What an idiot. I am, not, not Harris. Um, so, um, so yes, you have 10 to the 14th or 10 to the 15th molecules of single-stranded stuff. We do this with 40 nucleotides in a row of random sequence. Every position is a different letter. And so that means you have four to the 40 different possibilities in that 40 long sequence, which is 10 to the 24. And we only use a fraction of them. So every time you make a library to do this experiment, the distribution of sequences is not the same. It can't be. And, um, and then we put a protein a target into the mixture, and then in a set of biochemical steps, select the things from the library that bind to that target. It's that simple. And the only thing that's changed, only thing which took us a decade to figure out, is we make the libraries out of single stranded <coughs> DNA, not RNA, the way it started. The DNA is modified, as it says in red. I'll show you a picture of that. We demand that the things that we select uh, stay stuck to their protein target for a long time. That is, they have a slow dissociation rate from the thing they bind to. And then at the bottom, because of next-gen sequencing, when we have the final library after going through this you know, eight or nine rounds of selection to find the winners, instead of sequencing a few, because it was hard work, we sequence a lot of them. That's it. We sequence, you know, now we sequence 5,000 of them. And so we learn a lot about who they are. Okay, I hope that's clear. And the modifications are the heart of the biochemistry that we now do. So you remember, I think, that that pyrimidine has a five position there. And there's some chemistry, whoops, some chemistry that Bruce Eaton figured out a long time ago that allows you to iodinate the five position and then do some palladium fancy catalysis stuff that makes this thing that you can then decorate with adducts of any kind you want hanging off here, the R. And, it, and you remember from Watson Crickery that that's the base pairing surface of the pyrimidines. So that's the free position that you can hang stuff to make the molecules we're going to find have better chemistry than the standard RNA or DNA bases. Okay? And we've done that. And it says in this slide that we make triphosphates so that we can do this, because that requires triphosphates to be able to go down this path, come up, gonna get this eventually, and to be able to then come back with PCR and stuff like that, so you need triphosphates. And then when you're making the molecules, you want the phosphoramidites, and so we make all of that. And this um, shows the ones we published a lot about, and I'll show you how these funny modifications on the five position change aptamers into these things we now call somomers. Ooh. Somomers are slow off rate modified aptamers. So it was an acronym that was 
a winning acronym somebody got, not me, got dinner for two for th having this clever idea. Um, I wanted to call them Goldemers, uh, but nobody thought that was a good idea. And we have modifications of C, because the five position of C is also free. And so you get the sense that we get to make from the 30 different adducts a lot of chemistry that's not standard nucleic acid chemistry. So you could say, well, maybe they're going to be more like proteins than, than a nucleic acid, because you're making the chemistry broader. And we have worked on this for a long time. Many proteins that we've studied that will not yield an RNA or DNA aptomer do yield somomers that have very high affinity, high specificity, and high um, um, affinity, not really good KDs. And so one way to teach you that this is different than aptomer science is to show you one three-dimensional structure, and this will do for this. This is, a, we have three structures of somomers bound to their protein target. One is published in, um, wherever it was published, PNAS, I guess, last year in December, and two are being written up now. And as soon as you look at the structure, your brain says, oh my goodness, this is unlike any protein nucleic acid structure that I've ever seen in my life. And the best way to, to, to make the point visually, there are different rules for each of the three. They're not the same. The five position adduct in this somomer, which is bound to this protein, which is PDGF, the five position adduct on the U's, replacing the methyl of T, is a benzyl. You see those little pink things. Those are benzyl groups. And all you have to do is look at that one benzyl group in this three-dimensional structure to know that something new is happening. And the reason you know it is that in the protein right here is a hydrophobic chunk of the protein interfacing in the three-dimensional structure with this benzene that actually this benzyl group comes through a salt bridge and says, give me another kcal of something. So, the, the idea is that, I mean, you get it this way also. You look at all those things, and they're all pointing right at the protein. The other two structures are different. They're different rules. So we're going to have to do 10 more structures to be able to learn what this is about. But for sure, it's different. And there have been comparisons in that paper that Naboisha Janish published that say that aptomer protein complexes are not the same as somomer protein complexes. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about the reagents. And then I'm going to tell you this industrialization biotech kind of, it's almost like advertising. Wow, we made a lot of them. It says we made a lot of them. So down at the bottom, uh, we have now made more than 2,000 of these things against human proteins. Uh, we've made about 30 against bacterial proteins and about 2,000 against human proteins. So we have some work we're doing about, uh, about infectious disease. But by and large, everything we make is against human proteins. And on the present menu, which makes no sense to you yet, uh, but will in a minute, we use 1,129 of them on a big multiplex proteomic thing in an assay that quantifies 1,129 proteins in any sample, serum, blood, anything. Um, OK? OK. So now I'm going to show you how these 1,129 proteins are measured today in an assay that is just proteomics. So proteomics is measuring proteins and quantifying them in some sample. It works for tissue extract, serum, blood, cerebral spinal fluid, doesn't matter, okay? All works. And I want to show you the assay. It's all published. Uh, there's even a reference somewhere. It was published about a year and a half ago. Because so I'd rather show you the data and think with you about where this might go. What we do is we take all 1,129 somomers aimed at 1,129 different proteins. And we synthesize them chemically using the phosphoramidites we have. And we 
synthesize them. This is the 40 mer that is the DNA with its modifications. And it's synthesized so that on the five prime end is a fluor, a photocleavable linker, and a biotin. Oops. And the assay I'm about to show you uses all three of those things to be able to quantify the proteins in whatever solution or matrix that you're doing. So this is a word version instead of a uh, sort of data version of what the assay is, this proteomic measurement. So this is, this is the only one of these slides. The assay is divided into a front end and a back end. The front end is we mix in the 1,129 somomers with, call it serum or plasma, it doesn't matter, and we let it equilibrate. And then after a while, a while, a while being uh, too long, but because mixing these things is not so easy, after the equilibration, because there's a biotin, oh God, a biotin on the end of this thing, you can imagine partitioning the somomers on a streptavidin surface with the protein that's bound to it over here. And so there's a capture. And after the capture, you can imagine that we would then, here's the protein that you can't see, you can imagine that we're going to both label the, the um, protein with a second biotin, and we're going to cleave the photocleavable linker so that this thing will fall off the streptavidin now as a complex with the somomer and the protein with a biotin on it, ready for a second capture. What? Why would you do that? You do that because you're now capturing the somomer that's bound to the protein, throwing away all the somomers that are free, and then when you release that, you can quantify it as a surrogate for the protein you're trying to measure. So what it says down at the bottom is, wait a minute, we've turned a proteomic need into a DNA detection problem. So the somomer binds, and then we recover the one that's bound, we throw out all the ones that didn't bind, and then we measure it. And you can measure it by hybridization, because that thing up there has a fluor on it. You can measure it by qPCR. You can measure it by next-gen sequence. You can do anything you want, because it's a tube of DNA. So at the end of the front end, we have a test tube with only somomers in proportion to the proteins we're trying to measure. And then we measure the DNA. So that's it. Okay? It's all published, and you can read it if you care. Um, there are many people that have wanted to turn proteomics into a DNA measurement, and there are other people who've done it, but not this way. Okay? And this is the only way that we know that leads to enormous multiplexing capability. So, okay? so this is an example of a, a, an Agilent array printed with the complements of all 1,129 somomers. And since the things that are released have a fluor on them, we just hybridize onto this specialized Agilent chip, and we get spots like every Agilent chip, and you can quantify them, and you know where the complements are. And so you get quantitative data, and these are just showing some spike in recovery experiments. So this thing is quantitative, it's accurate, and I think that's all you really need to know. When we measure 1,129 proteins, the median limit of detection is 40 femtomolar, which is low. There's a big dynamic range. That's good. The accuracy of this thing is about 5%. And we only need about 40 microliters of sample to do all of it. So for people who have got samples that they've been collecting for years and years and years, you get to run them. And they're all waiting for this, right? And it's easy. Um, so that's the assay, all right? So when you do a set of assays on a set of samples, so this is the part that I labeled data, data, data. So 
we do the same. So it took us, yeah, it depends on, yeah, it took us eight to 10 years to figure this out. It was not fun, um, but it, that's how long it took us. And, 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 and the biggest invention actually came in spite of me. Uh, and there was a moment where I was completely clear what we should do, and which didn't work, and it was wrong, and everybody was afraid to tell me I was a jerk. <laughs> And then eventually somebody did the right experiment and came in and told me. And I was so happy. And they were all so afraid that I would be unhappy. How could you be unhappy when it finally worked? <laughs> I mean, it's sort of crazy. So it worked. And, and, and I get no credit. They do. Um, so this is an example of the way the data look when you do samples related to some clinical question. So I'm going to walk you through this. We do this over and over and over. So we have data for 1,129 proteins. And often, if not always, there will be two, sometimes it's not that way, two different groups of people. This particular example is people who were heavy smokers and people who were both heavy smokers and were, had been diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer. So this is about making a test for non-small cell lung cancer, the idea being, if you could do that in that group of people, you could save their life because you'd find the disease early, there would be a, a small operation like a lumpectomy, except it would be not called a lumpectomy, and the people would live. That's the idea. So, <clears throat> so this is an example of all the data for this one protein, this is number two, I'll tell you what this graph is in a minute. For one of the 1,129 proteins, you can see that this curve is all the people, all the people, the, their values, their quantitative data for this one protein, all of the people who had been diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer, and this is the heavy smokers who had not yet been diagnosed. So they have about a 1% rate of getting non-small cell lung cancer every year, so probably in this blue set were some people that had not yet been diagnosed but had early stage cancer. And you can see a shift in the two cumulative distribution functions. The people with the disease have a higher level on the average. The means are right across from here. There versus here, this is protein concentration. So you get 1,129 curves, datas, that look like that. Most of them look like this, because most proteins that you measure don't change when someone has non-small cell lung cancer. This is blood, remember. This is serum. So most of the things look like that. And this one that I picked randomly is down here. So anything below this p-value of 10 to the minus 4 we don't take seriously. Anything above it, we do take seriously, because we think that that's kind of the false discovery rate. And the best marker is that one. So you learn an for this particular two groups of people. So you learn something amazing. You learn that the very best biomarker we found is not good enough by itself not good enough by itself to tell who has cancer and who doesn't. It's good, but not good enough. If you were doing a pregnancy test and measuring HCG for pregnancy, if that was the non-pregnant woman, the best marker, this red curve would be over here. The difference is dramatic. It's binary. You need one biomarker to declare you are pregnant. But no biomarker that we found will tell us you have non-small cell lung cancer. So the idea is, gee, take that one and that one and that one and figure out some set of 10 that make the information better. That's the idea. It's a simple idea. <clears throat> and it works. So this is an example of what happens when you try to make a little algorithm with it says up there, 10 biomarkers and you know picking which 10 to use is not trivial because you want things that are not perfectly correlated with each other because if they're perfectly correlated with each other you don't get any extra information. 
So you have to do this carefully, and we, we know how to do that. We have probably 10% of our company is math type people. And this is a fairly accurate thing for finding early stage disease and might lead, we hope, to people who would otherwise die, uh, to be diagnosed early enough where a resection of their tumor would save their life. It's the, that's the simple idea, okay? Um, I wanna say um, that that product is being worked on by Quest Diagnostics, and we think uh, that it will be actually offered uh, to people either the end of this year or early next year. So that's kind of exciting. I wanna say something about where this is really headed as a, as a prequel for what's gonna come at the very end. It's clear that taking a snapshot is less good than sampling people over time. You'd have to be kind of, it would, it's just, you'd have to be crazy to not think that that will turn out to be true. And these are an example. Here's a, a clinical trial with two people in it. Okay, so, okay, well, it's sort of like Roseanne's clinical trial that she showed me today of herself and her identical twin sister. So this is one person who was a heavy smoker who had blood taken at all of these times and who had not been diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer. And here's a person who was a heavy smoker who was diagnosed way out here. And along the way, you saw the beginning in this 10, 10 protein uh, test of seeing something a couple of years earlier as though you might be able to imagine that this will get you to that resection earlier than you would otherwise get with CT scanning and stuff like that. So, I have no idea. Uh, you mean what's its name? Yeah. I have no idea. I have no idea what protein number two, one, or any other numbers. They're just, but I mean, it's all published, and I just don't know. I, I actually, I'm going to come back to that. That's a great question. I, I do know the names of some proteins that show up here. But in this particular case, and in most cases, I've decided that that kind of knowledge doesn't help me. So we've done a lot of these, and, and I want to spend the last five minutes kind of wondering why the answers turn out to be so surprising. So we'll come back, to that, and then you can tell me why I'm wrong, like you have for the 30 years I've known you. I mean, it'll be fun, okay? We'll, we'll have wine or something. Um, so I don't know the names of these particular guys, um, but, I, but some of the names that they, it's all, everything that we do is published, and you know, we can talk about it. Okay, so, um, so let me show you, this is, this is also thrilling. So we've done a lot of cancers, and I'll show you a list of things we've done. The idea of this is, gee, we could do it for anything. I mean, you could say that until you do a clinical trial and you don't find any biomarkers. And then you think, well, wait a minute, we're going to have 2,000 more proteins we measure at time t. We'll run the samples over again. I mean, it's just kind of a, in some ways, not, not, deeply thoughtful, you're just hoping to find biomarkers in an unbiased way. That's what's really going on here. So this is a study we've done uh, mostly with a, a guy named Peter Gans, who's at UCSF, who gave a big talk about this in, uh, at the American Heart Association last whatever it was. And, um, and it was a, it's a fascinating study. And the, the, the study is, doc, is sort of written about here, there were a thousand people who had a non-fatal uh, heart attack, usually a heart attack, not always, but uh, let's call it a cardiovascular event, but most of them, the people in this trial, had had a minor heart attack. Minor, because the docs called it minor, it did feel minor, I'm sure, to the people that had them, and they lived. And so shortly after they uh, were being cared for, they gave blood, one sample of blood, one sample of blood. And, um, and then they were followed for eight years. And some of them died, and some of them didn't, and, and they were just followed for a long time. And so we got all the samples from Peter and his colleagues, and, um, and we asked, we just measured all the proteins, and we found shockingly and wonderfully that there were a bunch of proteins that were elevated in the people, these are the elevated proteins by name, 
elevated in the blood right after their heart attack, their little one, that were, when they were elevated, predictive that the people were going to not do very well. Most of the people in the worst quartile actually die over the course of this study. And there were two proteins that were low in the people who did really poorly. So you can build algorithms with all of these things in it. And I'm going to tell you about this protein, GDF11, who's, which is also called BMP11, because there's a mouse experiment that was just published. I'm going to show you that mouse experiment as a way to give you a sense that you can learn something about the biology in spite of what I just said to Rick. Okay? So this is a group of proteins. And it turns out the performance of this thing is better at predicting what's going to happen to people in the eight years after this event than any other thing that's ever been found, including the Framingham and the new Framingham and the new Framingham plus CRP and all that stuff. It turns out that this led to Peter Gans. He's very excited. And we know they're excited because they're ready to, um, to be the first authors on the paper that we're going to write when we get done analyzing the 2,000-person study we did to confirm this. So we'll see. We haven't looked at the data yet for the 2,000 people. And we're hopeful that the 1,000-person study will repeat. And if so, it'll be published soon. Um, so here's a, a, a thing. Remember, I showed you that one of the biomarkers for really high risk was GDF11 when it was low in the blood of the people who had had a heart attack. That was the human data. We did a collaboration with two people from Harvard whose names are shown up here, Richard uh, Lee, Rick Lee, right up here, and Amy Wagers. And this paper was published in Cell in the last few weeks. And this is an amazing paper which I've now read. I had nothing to do with this. They do this. There are a couple of somologic people in the list of authors down here, lots of authors. And the experiment is really, I'll, I'll just do this mostly in words. The experiment is that mice, as they're aging, make heart things happen that look like the thickening of the heart as though you're approaching what in a human would be called some kind of congestive heart failure. So it's kind of like a human disease. And they discovered many years ago in this kind of a study that if you took a young mouse whose heart was healthy, this is all in their paper, a young mouse whose heart is healthy and an old mouse whose heart is damaged, and you hook up their circulatory system, so they're sharing blood. I imagine they're not running around. I imagine they're just kind of, you know, sitting in their cages watching TV or something. I don't know how they do this. I mean, it sounds really tricky. As soon as you do that, within four weeks of giving an old mouse young blood from a young mouse, their heart disease goes away. A remarkable experiment to me. Parabiosis is what it's called. Uh, the, the conjoined, it says conjoined, uh, conjoining two little guys together. And so they knew five years ago when they first did this that there was something in a young mouse that might help. And so they asked us if we would collaborate with them. We ran 20 samples, 20, of young mice and old mice. We'd made all of our reagents against human proteins. Duh. So some of them don't signal at all because the proteins are so different, right? Because it's like a monoclonal. But about 60%, so call it 600, of the things on our menu signal with presumably the right protein because who knows? You've got to do a lot of work to find that out. And, and we did this experiment with them and found that young mice had a very high level here. 
these are the young guys, had a very high level of this protein, GDF11. And the old mice had a very low level of GDF11, and they knew from Peter Ganz's work that GDF11 was a risk factor in the study we did with them because they'd been to that AHA thing. So they settled on this thing, and they did a remarkable experiment in the paper, which is they took an old mouse and handed it by injection purified GDF11 that they could buy, and the hearts got better. A remarkable piece of luck. <laughs> I'm going to come back to this luck. So the, the number of times that this is going to happen is unknowable by us, but it isn't going to happen every time. The chance that it's going to happen every time is low. Okay? So there's driver, drivers and you know all this language, so you don't really know. But in this particular case, they made a guess, and based on this little bit of data, they got a therapeutic effect in a mouse of handing, of injecting GDF11, and, and, it, and within four weeks, by the way, one injection. They didn't even do multiple injections. So, um, yeah, you don't care about that. So that's an amazing story of a mouse-human kind of thing. And they're, they eventually we'll all be old enough to get injected by GDF11, and it'll help us die of dementia is what'll happen. But <laughs> it's not funny, actually, but, but almost for sure true. Yeah, and so this is a slide of about half of the clinical trials we've done. And you know, you can look at it, you can ask me anything you want. It's a big, long list. And, um, and it's, it's a fascinating uh, list, and it's really only about half of what we've done. So the, 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 the hard part in building a company, of course, is to figure out what to do to build a company as opposed to, to satisfy your sense that you've built a platform that might be useful. These are all things that are for sure successful at finding biomarkers that are meaningful for some clinical question or another. I'll show you just a couple of them. So there's a pancreatic cancer panel that we've done that can't be used to just screen for pancreatic cancer because it's too rare, and so you'll get too many false positives. But for people that are symptomatic with the beginnings of you know, either pancreatitis or, or actual pancreatic cancer, you could imagine doing that. And we have decent data that, um, and it'll keep getting better, it can only get better, that we can distinguish between pancreatic cancer or not. The hope is, and there's no data for this, the hope is that pancreatic cancer like lung cancer or breast cancer uh, or prostate cancer will be something that can be treated by a lumpec the equivalent of a lumpectomy. And there are, the data for pancreatic cancer is sparse. You can't tell that. So, and, and you know, there will be some cancers that, that leave the primary quickly and some that don't. And so we don't know. Okay, we just don't know. Here's, here's one of my favorites. It brings up a, a problem that, that you must be thinking about. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, a, a blood test for mesothelioma, which is um, uh, essentially a, an asbestos-caused cancer of, the, of, a, of a piece of tissue. And, um, and, um, and we have a test that's perfect for early stage mesothelioma, nearly perfect. So you, would, you could do this every year on all the people who were exposed to asbestos, and it would be a great product. But the question is, what would the docs do to help the patients? And when you ask the mesothelioma doctors, what would you do? They do my kind of hand waving. Uh, you know, we would watch them. We'd monitor them better. We'd, who knows what they really mean? But nobody's got a plan to help us, and so you can't, you have to think about it, okay? You know, it's like, never mind, it's like a lot of things where you hope that having this test might help with the development of drugs, but maybe it should be used that way first before it's used to tell people that they're in big trouble. It's like if you had an early blood test for Alzheimer's, you're not sure you would do that either. It's the same problem. of of what's the action you would take. It's a, it's a problem. So I want to tell you a, about um, a story, a little story. 
about, uh, oh, that's great, about Duchenne's muscular dystrophy very quickly. We're very good friends with a woman named Pat Furlong. You can all read about her. She was written up in the New Yorker in a big profile about a year ago. Um, <clears throat> she had two sons die of Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. It's an awful disease. I'm sure you all know that this is from essentially knockouts in uh, the one, the carriers are women who have a knockout of one of their two dystrophin genes on the X chromosome. And when they make a boy, uh, that boy has a 50% chance of being a null for dystrophin. And those boys, those, these are Jerry Lewis kids is the, where you saw so many of these, these boys. And it's a, a fatal disease. And, um, and the question is, could you find something by doing proteomics on the boys with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy that might give you an idea to do something that's not gene therapy. Because getting a dystrophin gene into all the muscle tissues of, of a boy is not going to happen very easily. And so we did this unbelievably small study of 74 boys, uh, 30 controls or 29 controls, and the rest people with different dystrophin mutations. And we found something unlike anything we've ever seen in our 30,000s. I mean, the 30,000 samples and 75 of them kind of changed everything, I think. And so we, there's a beginning of us trying to help in these rarer diseases because the people with rare diseases don't get a lot of help from the pharma companies. Nobody wants to work on a disease that affects too many, too few people. So we're hoping that we'll be able to do that sort of thing. So the data are remarkable. So 126 proteins in the blood of boys with Duchenne's are elevated. That's 11%. We've never seen anything like that, ever, okay, ever. Even more remarkable, 100 proteins are diminished in the blood of boys. You, you cannot, you don't know where to start wondering how can proteins in the blood of boys with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy be low? You know, what is that coming from? It's not coming from dying muscle cells because that's dumping stuff into blood. We've never seen anything like this either, okay? And I want to say one quick thing, I mean, about one of the proteins is over here. This is the RET protein right here. Uh, I'll show you this again, I think, in a second. Oh, there it is. So this is the RET protein. What's that? It doesn't matter. The RET protein is a transmembrane, single transmembrane receptor. It's involved in a lot of different diseases. Nobody knows too much about it. And we measure the extracellular domain on, in our assay, and that thing went down okay, by a lot. It's practically a marker for... I mean, sufficient as almost a HCG-like marker, and you don't know what to say about it except it and a hundred other proteins are down, strongly down, in the blood of these boys. Here's here's a slide. This is meant as a tease. This is not a disease that you want to make light of because it's so awful. But this is the data. These are the data for all the boys in this study, the 74 person study, and it's against their ages, and the, the y-axis is the amount of red protein in their blood. And you know, you see all these red things down here, and there's all these red things down here, and they're low, and all the blue ones are high. It's practically a perfect marker. And then you look at this kind of stunning thing that I put this green circle around so you could look at it. This is not meant to be science. It's meant to be an idea. That the oldest boy in the study with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy has a normal level of red. Oh my goodness. Boy, you'd have to get excited about that if you were try if you're dreaming. So we're dreaming and we're trying to figure out what to do and maybe it's important. But it highlights the problem that the GDF11 story that I told you a minute ago kind of made as though you wouldn't think about it, which is that sometimes when proteins go up with disease, your temptation is to antagonize them. When they go down, your temptation is to supply it. Well, maybe for some of these things that go up, it's because your body is trying to be better. 
And in fact, the right thing to do is to give you more of the protein that goes up. You can't tell. There's no logic here. You just cannot tell. And so the problem is anytime you find biomarkers, and this is back to what Rick was asking, you kind of have to wonder um, something, you know, but you have to wonder what makes sense. So you do have to think about the activity of the proteins. So I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. So let me finish with, um, <clears throat> finish with where this is headed and what this is about. And then you can ask questions or we can all go have beer somewhere. That would be good too. So this slide, this is not data. I, I did this by hand uh, of what the goal is for personalized medicine or whatever it says, the personalized medicine. And of course, the goal is to live according to the blue curve the green curve. You'd like to have a high quality of life, and then you'd like to fall down dead. And you'd like to fall down dead in some amount of time. And you could argue whether you'd like to be dead in a week, a day, or a month. But in a broad survey of the 100 people that work at Somalogic, who are all ages, we ask that question, and nobody says, I want to suffer for four more years. Nobody does that, OK? So once you give up on the idea of immortality, you'd like to live the blue curve, and you would have some discussion about how steep this was. I am, of course, on the red curve. And in fact, I even highlighted my red curve data. <laughs> so that's me, OK? And, and what I'm kind of hoping is that I'll come back here in 25 more years, and I'll be over here, and this will be kind of doing this over time, and you don't know. Okay, so, uh, and also, I would like to suggest that after my seminar, I don't want any of you to hug me, because this happened exactly one month ago, and I have a last slide of that, not uh, x-ray, but a picture that I want to share with you. Okay. So the idea is longitudinal data tied to medical records and wellness and how many push-ups you can do and all of that stuff. And so the idea is to do this kind of thing annually. You don't even know if annually is right. I don't know whether, maybe you should do it every day. Maybe you should have one of these chips in your toilet and you pee on it. I don't know. Nobody knows, okay? This is unknown. So you have to think about this and work on making this the driver for evidence-based, actionable stuff, OK? So I want to talk a little bit about Harris's and my friend Carl, because I have a few slides that are kind of important to why I think the question Rick asked is a question that maybe we don't want to think too hard about in spite of the GDF-11 story, because I want to make an argument that human biology is pretty tough to understand. So I want to show you that argument. And it's an argument that, that some of you will object to. I, I presented this to Charles Cantor, one of the smart guys, um, just a, a couple of weeks ago. And he thought it was total crap. So I'm going to show it to you anyway, because we've been emailing back and forth. And I think he's wrong, and he thinks I'm wrong. So I'm just going to show you, and you can all decide, OK? Um, you can do anything you want. So Carl as you'll recall, figured out all by himself. He had people helping him, but it was his brain. He figured out two important things. One was the way to learn about descent, evolution, was to study the ribosomal RNA after some false starts and 5S RNA and other kinds of things. And then he got kind of lucky, because when he did that, he ended up identifying this third kingdom, the Archaebacteria, which is uh, the purple one over there. This is humans in red. And I want to show you why it is true. I want to convince you in a one minute that the things on the right are kind of optimized, whatever that means, and humans are not. So I want to make an argument that is the opposite of an intelligent design argument. I would do that anyway, OK? So here's the argument in one slide. Uh, you can read it. I will read it to you. This is my favorite slide in this presentation, except for the last slide. So you want to ask, 
I want you to ask how many mutations per base pair have happened in the bacteria since they became their own species? And then I want you to ask, I want to ask you the same question for humans. So that's about who's been hammered at the level of DNA, right? That's what I'm trying to ask you. And you can do the calculation. Of course, you have no idea what life was like 65 million years ago, 100 million years ago, 3 billion. So you don't know anything. So you've got to make up stuff. So this is made up. This is hand wavy. But I like it because I didn't use numbers that are made be what I wanted. I used the numbers I know from today. So the bacterial mutation rate is mostly known. And we know that they divide every hour or thereabouts in the wild, wherever. Sometimes they have feasts or famine. Sometimes they go a week without doing anything. If they're living in Antarctica, they can go two months before they double, sometimes once a year. So forget that. Just think of it as an hour. And think about the mutation rate as kind of 10 to the minus 6 per base pair per replication. And then give them a few billion years. And then you sit down in the back of the envelope and you figure out how many changes have happened in a bacterial genome? Duh. And you come out with this remarkable number, forgetting all the other fancy ways to, to evolve, forget all that stuff. And the number is that they have made, unlikely, 100 million changes at every letter during the time they were a species. 100 million. It's like a little metronome. Here, today I'm an A, tomorrow I'm a G, next week I'm a C, you know, whatever. 100 million changes per base pair for every bacterial species with only a few made up numbers. And then you go do the same calculation for humans and you can get there any way you want, including just look at how many SNPs there are. Duh. And that'll get you a different number, 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4. So the difference between the hammered bacterial genomes and the human genome is a trillion fold by that criteria of changes per base pair. So you can remember that number. It's a trillion. In order to say a trillion, I had to make the SNP number 10 to the minus whatever I did. But you know, it's probably 10 times higher, so it's actually 100 billion. Come on, OK? And when Charlie Cantor got upset about this in, in a symposium, that he was my guest, and I was paying him to come. And he, and he said, but, but you, have to, you have to count all the time since the mice, I said, mice. How about, he said, 65 million years instead of four. So I used four, OK? Because that's, I'll show you that in a slide. So 65 million years gets you another log. That's not a big deal, OK? You can't get to thinking that our genomes are hammered, I think. So this is my uh, favorite picture. That guy is, was two, two feet tall. He was a whole issue, he or she was a whole issue of science from these Berkeley guys that found all these bones somewhere in Africa, and they got all excited. They, they hit them so that they could work on them, and they ended up making an artist's rendition of this little guy. And, um, and that's what happened in the last four million years. So four million years in evolutionary time is nothing if your mutation rate is 10 to the minus ninth per replication every 10 or 15 years or whatever it is. And when I showed this once to a physicist friend, this is really important. You can remember this also. Remember a trillion and remember this bottom thing. He said, huh, so humans are prototypes. We're version 1.0. Well, that's fairly insulting, considering you know we do art, and we have opera, and we have all this stuff. But I have to kind of wonder about that. So, um, so the bottom part of this is that I consider us to be clunky. We're not hammered in our genomes. And those of you who are old enough read the article by Francois Jacob in 1975 or 6 about evolution as tinkerer, the most important thing ever written. You get stuck somewhere. You go down some path. You can't back up. It's the same thing, except much more eloquent. Okay, And we are, as it says down here, um, we haven't had time to get there. So you know, when the sun blows up, we'll be there. Okay? So the way to remember all this is to think about a Rube Goldberg metaphor for evolution, which people hate, but I love. So he was a famous guy. And here's my favorite of the thousand I've looked at. I like many of them. This was his picture of a self-opening umbrella, which is meant to be a metaphor for biology, human biology, non-optimized biology. If you were going to design 
by Darwinian selection over three billion years, this would not be what you would do. But he drew this. The umbrella is right there, and this device, he did this always, this was linear thinking on his part. He wanted, when it rained up there, he wanted that umbrella over there to open. So he had this wonderful picture. The rain falls on a dried prune, so his name was Goldberg, so prunes were a big part of his life, dried prunes, I'd like to say. For those of you of that persuasion, I grew up that way, so I'm familiar with prunes. And when that dried prune got wet by the rain, the idea was to make the umbrella open. And what happened was the prune swelled, this thing flicked, it turned on this little lighter thing over here that lit the candle. The candle made the thing, the whistle thing, the boiling thing, the boiler water went through the whistle. And this little monkey disconnected, there's no connection. And he hears, he's got an ear, two of them, and he hears this whistle and he says, whoa, and he jumps over here on this thing, it swings, and then that thing gets cut, the balloon goes up, the balloon goes up, it pulls up the doors of the cage, and out fly the birds who are connected to the umbrella, bang, self-opening umbrella. So that's human evolution, the way I see it, for a non-optimized creature. And it leads you to understand that the deep desire we have when we find biomarkers that say something smart is tough because this thing evolved in some strange way. We don't know how we evolved. So, you know, here's a good example. If you knew 95% of it, how many of you would say it's a monkey? Well, none of you would say it's a monkey. You would say, I have no idea what it is, and that would be the right answer. And when you know 5% of it, you know, you can't even get the prune, you know. All you know is it rains and there's a monkey and the umbrella opens. You don't know anything. And we're at that stage, I claim. So the answer is you use omics-driven stuff to make actionable stuff happen in healthcare without worrying too much about what it means. Correlations are good enough, and you figure out how things work later. That's the idea of this. So this is my last slide. It's about evolution. And um, you, can, you can see that, that, that it's just an outrageously stupid slide uh, and is really what I think. I don't know whether that's version less than 1.0, that guy. But this, if, if this leads to an active chainsaw, this guy is not going to make a lot of babies, is all, all I want to say. So. Um, Thank you. That's, that's where we are. Thanks. You can ask questions if you want. You don't have to. I don't care. It's up to you guys. Anything? Yeah. I wouldn't be quite so pessimistic about the utility of, of, of useful biomarkers with untreatable diseases. And I think there are a, a lot of therapies coming down the pipe that are kind of can cancer therapies, very differently organized than the way we're doing it now. And so you can, in fact, will be able to treat people with current natural diseases. So I, I, I agree with that. I, I mean, the, the tension for me is always the the tension about the patient, okay? So the patients that we're gonna help the most right away are gonna be the ones in clinical trials and we're gonna do choices about better choice of who's gonna be in a clinical trial. So we talked this, this morning about that. I agree with you. Pessimistic is the wrong word. I just don't like the, for me, I don't like the idea of promising something that you can't deliver on to patients and, and none of us do, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Fascinating. It's uh, very thought provoking. Now, a lot of the methodology showed you serum, and I'm wondering when you look at the actual tissues, affected tissues, did yes. you see a heightened response? And sometimes could you see things that maybe you couldn't see in the systemic, yeah. where you're looking downstream, where it's maybe very peripheral? Yeah. So, thanks for that. That, that. So, we've done one enormous set of experiments in which we took. Um, people who were having a, a lung resection for a non-small cell lung tumor. And when the lung, the lobe was removed, the 
tumor was separated from the healthy tissue at different distances from the tumor, that the different distances didn't matter. And we analyzed on the full plex, the 1129, the differences. And we saw, and it's published, we saw a wonderful set of differences that were dramatic, actually more dramatic, both ups and downs. And, um, and the things that were up, we saw about half of in the blood, serum or plasma, as though the limits of detection were good enough and the slow clearance of that stuff when it was, because that's in there also. If, if, if you, you can calculate um, what would happen if you took that tumor and lysed it and you happen to be lucky enough to then sample the seven liters of blood against the cubic mill, you know, whatever it is, centimeter of tumor. And you can kind of do that, but then as, as, um, as the guy from Stanford published once, that you're never gonna find, uh, I'll think of his name in a minute, there's, you're never gonna find tumor sec secreted things. But his argument, of course, made some assumptions about their clearance time. If they don't clear quickly, then you'll find them. And we found about half of them in blood. So it was, so I no longer think it's hard to find tumor specific things in the blood, but the answer was more dramatic in the tissue. And we, we should do more of that. And I actually think, well, I think a lot of things. I think that, that grinding up biopsy stuff and doing that complete analysis routinely. You could do that if we could make our thing a little quicker. You could do it right in the operating room, probably. So that, that's the answer to that. Yeah? yeah. For a snapshot from today, uh, what's the, the current costing of doing the surgery? <coughs> and secondly, uh, do you contract, does your company contract with university labs? Say the last thing. Does your company contract with university labs? Oh yeah, sure. So, so, um, so the present cost, the actual cost of goods um, of the work we do is, is going to be, but is not yet, so inexpensive that, that we will do this as a, as a commodity. That's our goal. The goal is to make the cost in the market $100 or less. It is not that now. It costs us more than that ourselves to run the test today. We have lots of pharma and bio, you, you hear hand waving. We have lots of biotech and pharma partners who pay us between $1,000 and $2,000 per sample to get all these data because it helps them. And we've done collaborations. The, the, the work we did with, with Rick, Rich Lee and Amy Wagers at Harvard in that GDF 11 story, we did as a collaboration, and we just collaborated. I mean, so we've done both, okay? And, and as you might imagine, would make sense to, in building a company. Is that, is that enough for that? Yeah. yeah, the goal though is really to get the price down. So, so we, at lunch today, we were talking about the Supreme Court case about, uh, about BRCA1 and BRCA2 testing, and I don't want the last stage of my career to be one of making a $2,000 test that everyone would like to do once a year but can't. So we have the opposite model. Okay. Um, yeah, anyway. Uh, are you, um, well, first of all, I thought that was another great performance. I just have one question. Are you sure that, are you sure that your seven uh, long Sensitivity is better than any of the other. So this, I want to ask you, I want to stop at you. I love you so much. So Rick is my old friend, and Rick knows the. This is a setup question. You're watching a setup, and you're watching because he knows, and I do also, that years ago I was at Princeton giving a seminar, and a young graduate student said at the end. Can I do this? This can you can you're going to have to delete this. And I don't care. I'm young. I'm old. It doesn't matter. And this guy raises his hand and said, "Doctor Gold, Doctor Gold, you said back in slide 21 that." And he said, "Are you certain of that?" And without having prepared this, I said, "Young man, 
I've only been certain of one thing in my life. The first time I masturbated, I was certain I was going to do it again. I actually <laughs> said that. It, it was the worst moment of my life, but my friend Rick won't let me forget it. So what can I say except, you know. <laughs> Oh, oh, another one. It goes back to uh, really the first slide, the glycomics you need to add on. But, but I ask the question of protein too because of our interest, your old interest in things like small cell and non small cell point carcinomas that are loaded with your favorite polysaccharide acid on neural cell adhesion. So, I wonder, do you have any, do you have any information? Yeah, not at all. So, so, no, not, 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 yeah, no, because no. they are so yeah. zero. So I can't even tell, I cannot. There are two answers to Rick's question, and they're really important. The first is, I can't remember who's on the list of 1129, except I know red is, and I know GDF11 is. I, I mean, I don't remember, because to me, they're all the same. And, and so that's not an answer, but we can send you the list and you can think about it. The, the more important question you're asking, I think, the important question you're asking, which everyone wants to know, is what are you doing about all the post-translational modifications of proteins that you know are driving stuff? And what we do is measure the available epitopes on the protein target. So we make one reagent that binds to one epitope, and if that epitope is diminished, it could be because the protein is there in a lower concentration. Could be. Could also be that there's a modification that hides the epitope. Could also be that there's a modification that changes the shape of the epitope and the binding goes down or up. So you don't, you, this is a, a reagent game and the right thing to make everybody happy who would like us to do that is to make reagents that were sensitive to the various post-translational modifications. And that is an unbelievable amount of work. We know how to do it. You get a protein without and a protein with, and you counter-select, and you, you can do it. And we know we can do that. But we have to make a decision about whether it will aid us in making a good diagnostic call. And we haven't been driven to do that yet. talk about unhypothesis-driven research and kind of broad uh, searches, and that, I'm wondering how that fits with the with drug company's uh, ethos, which is very reductionist, very pathway-driven, very FDA, uh, you know, sort of monitored. And so is there a culture clash here or, or not? Uh, yeah, for sure. Of course, there's a culture clash. I mean, we've We've only been talking a little while. Of course, there's a culture clash. I mean, this is the most dressed up I've been in 10 years, OK? So this is, for me, a big deal in honor of Harris, OK? So, so the drug companies do do reductionist stuff. And they're all studying the same pathways. I mean, there was this article about PSCK9, uh, this thing about, <clears throat> about lipids. And, and <coughs> you know, there are 10 companies that are making antagonists of the same protein. So they, are, they all do that. I mean, and the biotech companies try to find a, something a little different, and they're, they, it's higher risk because the things go away. And so there is that. And the thing that, I, that I'm, I'm more concerned about, so they get over that. They eventually say, help me. And when they say, help you, you help them. So we have a lot of pharma customers doing unbiased stuff with us. Probably we have 40 customers using this SOMASCAN thing, in, and they're not afraid of it. They're not afraid it's going to shut down a program or they're going to find toxicity. They're, the ones that are working with us are not afraid of it. And they'll fit it into their mindset, and, and we don't control what they do. They just get the data and do whatever they want. So I'm, I'm uh, the, the, the closest I've come to hearing about more than a culture clash, an actual financial economic fear is people have said to me, well, what if we see some obvious tox, you know, think uh, 
well, just think, you know, whatever it is. Think of, think of the Merck compound for, uh, doesn't matter. And what if you found a, 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 a toxicity that would prevent the development of the drug, as opposed to finding it five years later when people die? And my assumption is that nobody wants people, to, no matter how crass you are about, you know, commercial interests, that nobody wants people to die. And so I think the pharma companies are better than that. So I think that what you're imagining might be true is really about sharing data, which we've done with lots of them. We have some really committed customers who send us a lot of samples because they're learning about the diseases they care about. And, and so I, I think that's kind of going away. It's just data, you know? I don't know. Yeah. Can Soma let us use as therapeutics, number one. Number two, you said, how can the deliveries recognize the different R groups on the derivatives? Do you have the same R group on the different R group on the same Soma lab? No. Uh, look what I did. Oh, I know where I'm going. Hang on. Don't go away. Um, you, you might go away. I'll, I'll spend an hour doing this. Yay. Um, so when we do the selections, we use one fully modified nucleotide. So the benzyl, for example. When we made those libraries, every U in the library had a five-position benzyl. So there was no deconvolution, no work to figure out who had benzyl and who didn't. It was one. Okay. Then if that library didn't yield a winner of appropriate KD and stuff, we would try with a different library, that sort of thing. And we now can do both a C and a U, so you could imagine putting in two. But when you sequence, there's no uncertainty. Every nucleotide has that five position. And, and you recall, I know you know this, but I want to remind you, that the, that's the base pairing surface, then that is the position, oh, Larry, the five position of the pyrimidines years and years ago when people used T7 RNA polymerase 20 years ago to put a biotin in an RNA made and a little piece of DNA, you could buy from somebody or another uh, the molecule that looks like this with a big linker and a biotin hanging off the five position was no problem. So that is the free place to hang stuff without interfering with PCR or, or sequencing. You cannot combine multiple different algorithms on the same. So you do not. But when, but if you re, if you were to read the paper in. Um, in PNAS about the PDGF somomer, whose structure I showed you, after we found the molecule, we then went through and tried many substitutions chemically to enhance. It would, it would be like somatic mutation in, a, in an antibody or something like that, where we tried these things and we got better molecules out of it. I have a question for therapeutics. Yeah, the question for therapeutics is, so Kit and I have been talking to each other about therapeutic peptides and therapeutic aptamers since we met each other uh, more than 20 years ago. And for those of you who don't know, the first uh, drug that was aimed at VEGF was done at this company Nexstar that, was the, that we did and that eventually was uh, used in the eye. And its launch year was the first approved drug as an anti-VEGF compound. It was two years earlier than Lucentis, the Genentech antibody, and competed for those first two years with the off-label use of Avastin, which was essentially used off-label and injected into the eye um, legally by, by doctors uh, who made that choice. And, um, and so you know in the eye that compound worked. And we have a program, a good one, aimed at macular degeneration with a bispecific pair of cell members that we make as one long DNA. And so, so and there's a, a, a PDGF aptamer that we selected at uh, Nexstar 15 years ago that is now in clinical development by a company called Optitech. So the eye is easy because it can't go anywhere. So you're not worrying about pharmacokinetics, you're not worrying about clearance, you're not worrying about anything.
just need activity. Um, and we have a program doing that. The deeper question of these 2,000 molecules we have is will they be like monoclonals with some advantages, penetrate a tumor better than a big antibody, for example, very high affinity, very high specificity, and we are also working on that hard. And our business model is to make those molecules available to everybody because we're going down this pathway of diagnostics and wellness but because we have all these molecules, we're just establishing how to use them therapeutically and trying to essentially hand them to people who want to do the development. I think we're done. Uh, thank you. Thank oh, Harris, you want? Oh, are we done? Oh, good. <laughs> yeah.